Gracious Lord God, help us to be a church that not only strives for the best answers, but also a church that strives to ask the great questions. And with longing hearts for meaning and for your presence, for a living relationship with you, Lord, draw us alongside one another in love and care and conversation and service so that we may be built up in faith toward Christ and in love toward one another. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you remember where you were when your whole life changed? For good or for ill? I'll bet you do. You remember where you were that moment when everything in your whole life story took a turn? I'll, I'll bet you do. A lot of people uh, who know me know this little story about me that in December of 2001, when I was bow hunting, I fell out of my tree and broke my neck. A lot of people know that. I spent four months in a halo brace. You can still see the notches in my forehead from that immobilizing brace that was screwed into my skull. What people probably don't know is that in April of 2002, when I got that halo brace off, I did two things right away. The first thing I did is I took my daughter, Emily, to the father-daughter Girl Scout dance. Imagine how happy I was to be able to dance with my daughter and lift her in the air and, and, and sweat and laugh and, and sing. The second thing I did is I took my three-year-old son and we went for a walk in the woods and we stood right in the spot where I landed at the bottom of that tree. And as we were holding hands looking up at that tree, my three-year-old son looked at me, I swear to God, he said, Dad, what does the word paralyzed mean? He was three years old, but he had heard people say that word, as in, how fortunate your father is not paralyzed. It's amazing when you return to a place where something happened in your life, the chapel where you got married, or the scene of an accident like that. And it's amazing in that moment how often it is the deeper truths are found, not in the answers, but in the questions that are asked in that place. That's a powerful, powerful moment. And I don't know if you ever noticed this, but you know, in life, a lot of times we dig for the best answers because we want to be intelligent, we want to be faithful, we want to have this rich, full, centered life. But if we were to stop and consider the questions, I bet we'd find something really, really amazing. And that's certainly true in the Bible. As a matter of fact, some of the most amazing, crucial moments in Scripture in the whole God story narrative happen around questions. Not earth-shattering heavenly answers, but in questions. Have you ever noticed that? When the serpent beguiles Eve and draws her and Adam into sin, he does so with a question. Did God say that you could not eat of every tree in the garden? And the question opens up space for doubt and confusion. And later, it says in Genesis, as God is walking in the garden, what do we hear? We hear a question. Adam, where are you? Well, I was, I was naked and I was afraid, so I hid myself. And God says, who told you that? Can you hear it? The power of the narrative is packed into the question. The poignant care of a parent reaching out to a child in that moment. The, the, the amazing power is in the question. When, when God calls to Moses from the burning bush, there are questions. Moses says, well, well, how will people believe me? And if I go to your people to free them from slavery, what is your name? And when, when David slays Goliath, the giant comes out on the field of battle and taunts him with a question. Am I a dog that you would send a boy after me with sticks? And, and, and in the story of Jesus, he asks, among other things, what are you looking for? Who do you say that I am? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And after he has been raised from the dead, he seeks out those who turned away from him and says three times, Simon, do you love me? Three times to mirror the three times that Peter denied him. Do you love me? And I want you to notice in this God story today from the book of Acts 
that there are powerful questions that could impact your life of faith. And if you look at those questions, I bet you'll find something really, really great today. First of all, Philip heads into the wilderness led by the Spirit where he meets this powerful Ethiopian. And you know what? Their interaction begins with a question. Philip goes over and says, do you understand what you are reading? Oh, and by the way, uh, you might not know this, but it was actually considered rather undignified for a grown man to run in this ancient culture. If, if a man were to set aside all dignity and, pre and pretense to actually run, that means that he was about to do something important. It says that Philip runs to ask this question of the Ethiopian. The father of the prodigal son in the parable runs to greet his son on the road because of the urgency and love and care he has for his son. Abraham runs when he meets three visitors at his tent to show them hospitality. Running is not something in this, in this culture that, that grown men did. Oh, by the way, last night when we left, the ushers shook my hand, and there were four or five men there, and they said, Pastor Jeff, we're so glad we don't have to run anymore. Thank you for giving us biblical support to our argument. But here Philip runs to greet this man, and he runs to him with a question. Do you understand what you're reading? And it makes me marvel again at how important it is in the church for us to learn how to show hospitality to other people, to be curious about others, to be courageous enough to, to set aside some pre-churchly pretense we think that we have to have in order to learn more about new friends. I wish that we could do a better job in the church of listening to one another and asking one another questions and framing conversations around other people instead of being so quick to want to talk about ourselves. I recently read a great little book called Good to Great by Jim Collins. I don't know if you've read it. But in a little addendum to this book, Jim Collins tells a story when he was teaching at Stanford University in 1988. And he sought out another professor, a man by the name of, of uh, John Gardner, and asked him what he could do to be a better professor. Gardner has served as uh, Secretary of Health and Education and Welfare before he taught at Stanford. And his answer to Collins absolutely stung him to the core. He said, it occurs to me, Jim, that you spend a lot of time trying to be interesting. Why don't you invest more time in being interested? And he said that question changed his life. So could we become a more interested church? Could we become people who naturally espouse a curiosity toward others? And yes, I know we're itching to talk. I know we're itching to tell people about our faith and the things that we know to evangelize. But maybe the greatest church of all is not an interesting church, but an interested church. Maybe the greatest church of all will be a church that says, hey, we've got all the right answers. Not that church, but a church that says, let's ask the big, big questions. Because Philip ran to this man to ask him that question. And please remember, too, that people like this Ethiopian were ritually excluded from the Jerusalem temple. They were considered blemished. They were not fully welcome into the worship life of the community. Not at all. So what if we were a church that, like Philip, literally held the, held the call of the Spirit to run to people who were excluded from the community and ask them about their lives and their questions? What if we considered this call of the Spirit that would put us in the path of other people to show interest in them, to learn more about them, so we could usher them into a deeper faith in God? That would be an amazing thing if the church could do that. You know what? That's something you could do today. You could do that right after worship today. That's not rocket science. To seek out someone and to learn about them and to set aside all of the churchly pretense that we sometimes have and all of the uncomfortable feelings for the sake of someone else's story. You could do that. You could do it today and be a more interested church. And lo and behold, we follow along the narrative, and what do we find? The Ethiopian answers Philip's question with a question. Don't you love that? When that happens? Well, how do I know unless someone guides me? 
So the curiosity and the warmth and the hospitality of Philip now is responded, there's a response from the Ethiopian almost as if to say, well, come and tell me what you know. Share with me something about your faith. It's all in the power of the question. Last weekend, I I had a great opportunity to actually preside at my mother-in-law's wedding. How many people get that kind of gift in their lives? My mother-in-law had been a widow for 16 years, and she met this amazing, sweet, elderly gentleman. His name is Mel, and she fell in love with him, and they got married last Saturday. And after the ceremony, we were sitting at the reception bar. One of my brother-in-laws, who also married one of Marilyn's lovely daughters, turned to me and said, you know, we need to tell Mel that when she asks you a question, she's really trying to tell you something. (laughs) Right, married people? And he said, if she says, where are the scissors, what she means is, please go get the scissors. And we all laughed and we toasted Mel and Marilyn, but of course he was right. And oh, what a church we would be if people of faith could only set aside their fears and concerns and become interested in other people and invite them deeper into the story and have conversation with them about their own story. That's what's so instructive and beautiful about the story of Philip and the Ethiopian. And as they ride along in the chariot, reading the prophet Isaiah, and they're reading about Jesus, guess what happens? A question. (laughs) Suddenly they come across a place where there is some water and the Ethiopian says, well, look, here is some water. What's to prevent me from being baptized? You see, the truth is always found in the question. Hear the truth of a man's deep longing for meaning and faith. It's all come down to this. We have Philip's courage and willingness to engage someone new, the readiness of this man's soul, the spirit's prompt that draws them together in this moment of radical inclusivity and the final question is fully answered even before he asks it because these men are reading about the spirit of jesus himself and so finally the answer comes as resounding as it can be no more beating around the bush what is to prevent me from being baptized nothing (laughs) nothing is to prevent you from being baptized it's like the wrapping of a judge's gavel it's final All of the questions and conversation have come down to this. What is to prevent me, an outcast and a foreigner, from being welcomed into God's grace? And the answer is nothing. Nothing can prevent it. And what is to prevent you and me from being collected up in God's saving grace? Nothing. What is to prevent you and me from being swept up in the swelling kingdom of God that is built around Jesus' death and resurrection? Nothing. And what can keep us from being claimed once and for all without exception as children of God? What is to keep us ultimately from being raised from the dead with Jesus? Nothing is. Nothing. And we will be a church that is more interested than it is interesting. A church that may not always get every answer right, but will certainly ask big questions. A church that sends out hundreds of adults and youth every week to live their faith. People who are curious and brave enough to set aside their fears and literally run to their neighbor, ready to listen and encourage and love and serve a church that sends 560 blessing bags to Place of Hope, that sews quilts, that, that, that calls young adults into global mission. We find the great truth in the questions, but our hearts are lost until we hear God's final ultimate answer. And God's answer is nothing. Nothing can prevent the grace that I have for you. And that grace sets us free to live one another as Philip did on the road to Gaza. Amen. Please stand.